Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'd like to start our session today. Thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, there are good synergies in the transfer system between Hong Kong and Malaysia against an increasing number of technology companies in Malaysia and these opportunities in Hong Kong and beyond. Uh, the webinar will discuss the latest development in technology ecosystem in Malaysia, provide an update of some of the innovative companies in Hong Kong, as well as uh, competitive advantages and attributes that Hong Kong has for startups to expand further in the greater Asia market. Mm -hmm. First of all, we would like to say thank you for the organizer, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, Invest Hong Kong, and Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporations for organizing this webinar. In addition, a great appreciation to Malaysia Digital Economic Corporation who supported us in making this webinar happen. Uh, for your reference, uh, the agenda of today's webinar is available at the right top corner with the agenda icon at the webinar display. Uh, we will start our session with the welcome remarks from the Gen Director General of Hong Kong Economic Trade Office, Mr. Kin Wai Law, followed by several presentations from Start Me of Hong Kong, Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporations, and Malaysia Digital Economic Corporations. At the end of the webinar, we will have uh, 20 minutes Q&A sessions and networking. Uh, for those who have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the right-hand side of the webinar. Uh, without further ado, uh, we would like to invite Mr. Kin Wai Lo, Director General of Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, to give uh, welcome remarks. Mr. Lo was born in the mainland of China. He graduate, graduated from the University of Hong Kong and holds a degree in actuarial science. He joins the Hong Kong uh, Civil Service in 2001. Mr. Law assumed his office in Hong Kong Economic Trade Office in Jakarta in December 2018. Before that, he had served the Hong Kong Economic Trade Office in Washington, D.C. for almost four years. Mr. Kin Wailo, the floor is yours. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um... Glad to see you all. Um, and uh, also thanks to uh, Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation, Invest Hong Kong, and Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation for co-organizing and supporting today's webinar. So this is part of the Hong Kong government's ongoing efforts to strengthen relations with overseas stakeholders to explore opportunities of partnership and to enhance people-to-people -people bonds, particularly under the new normal. So Malaysia and Hong Kong have very close trade and economic ties for years. So the average annual growth rate in bilateral trade, trade between 2015 and 2000 was more than 12%. And uh, last year, so in 2019, Malaysia was Hong Kong's seventh largest trading partner and ranked second amongst all ASEAN countries. Similarly, Hong Kong was Malaysia's seventh largest trading partner in 2019 and the fourth largest export market, and also a conduit for trade and investment between Malaysia and mainland China. So Hong Kong was the second largest source of FDI to Malaysia in 2019, amounting to 27%, uh, which was uh, roughly 2 billion US dollars of the country's total FDI inflows of the year. Our strong bilateral relations are also underscored by high level uh, visits and collaboration. So here are some recent examples. Um, our Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, Mr. Edward Yao, led the 52 strong delegation of businessmen, professionals and startups to uh, visit Malaysia in last November. So on that trip, um, our Secretary also visited uh, uh, MDEC. And uh, recently in September, the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau and MITI jointly held a high-level mm -hmm. webinar on reinforcing collaboration, which was raised by Senior Minister Dato Sri Mohammed Asmin Ali and Secretary Yao. So in the trying times of the pandemic, it is very important to foster stronger bilateral ties to reconnect. It is also timely to build closer economic partnerships and to relaunch the economy while grasping new opportunities from such emerging sectors as innovation and technology, smart city initiatives, e-commerce, as well as digital communication and digital um, entertainment. Innovation and technology is a policy priority of the Hong Kong government and also at the heart of the Greater Bay Area. Our city's world-class research and development capabilities and sound legal system including internationally recognized protection of intellectual property rights, 
puts us in an apt position in this regard. Our epidemic control and prevention work over the year has brought about much insight in taking forward innovation and technology development, including transforming conventional surface modes with innovative mindset and embracing the new normal with wider use of technologies. Our advanced digital infrastructure and technology have been widely applied to tackle the challenges brought by the pandemic, enabling the financial services sectors and many other economic activities to function as normal in our city. Looking ahead, Hong Kong government has just announced the Smart City Blueprint 2.0 to further our endeavor through innovation and technology to promote economic development and to enhance people's livelihood. So in the greater sense, we'll continue to focus on creating opportunities and enhancing our position as the prime platform and key link for the region, including to uh, further facilitate the Belt and Road Initiative and the Greater Bay Area Development. So for some, um, some have expressed concern over the national security law enacted earlier in the year. I would like to take this opportunity to reassure our friends in Malaysia that there is no need to worry. It was in fact a turning point to restore peace and order in Hong Kong. All legitimate rights and freedoms continue to be protected under the basic law and the laws of Hong Kong. The business and investment environment in our city remains as vibrant and conducive as ever. So in a nutshell, Hong Kong stands ready to continue to share our experiences with Malaysia and to strengthen our bilateral relations, particularly with the part relating to Malaysia under the ASEAN Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement and Investment Agreement having come into force in October last year. Bilateral trade and investment between our two places have further become much easier. So I trust that this webinar will further consolidate our strong collaboration and facilitate exchanges of ideas on how both sides can continue to work together to embark on new partnerships and to grasp new opportunities in the region. So once again, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lo. Uh, next, we would like to invite uh, Ms. Jane Chan, Head of Stop Me of Hong Kong. Jane is a Head of Stop Me of Hong Kong at Invest Hong Kong, the government department that's responsible for attracting and retaining foreign direct investment into Hong Kong. Stop Me of Hong Kong is the uh, Invest Hong Kong startup division established in 2014, aimed at attracting innovative startups, investors, and other stakeholders to Hong Kong. Prior to joining Invest Hong Kong, Jane was executive, executive director at PIE, a global nonprofit network focused on fostering entrepreneurship and management roles at advertising and digital agencies, startup investor and incubators, management consulting and manufacturing companies. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Jane, Ms. Jane, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Law, um, ladies and gentlemen, and you know our co-organizers. Thank you ever so much for attending this and, and actually for inviting me to speak here as well. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes or so to give you a little bit of information about the Hong Kong startup ecosystem, potentially the kind of support you can expect if you were to establish your, your startup here in Hong Kong. And, um, you know, our, our organisation Invest Hong Kong is a government department helping overseas companies to establish here. And we have um, eight different sector teams that really have um, sector expertise to potentially support you in, in a very deep way should you be bringing your company here and we also have over 30 offices around the world as well to provide um, additional input and any kind of information and support you require if you're interested in looking at the hong kong market so um, if we can just move on to the the next slide i'll tell you a little bit more about um, the kind of support you can get from um, our department so effectively we can you know help you across the whole planning to execution phase if you're thinking about expanding into hong kong you know that starts from very simple things in terms of maybe just giving you some information about your specific sector here in hong kong and what the opportunities are during your planning phase when you're actually coming to to set up we can connect you to various um 
government departments for licenses support you with these applications and all this kind of advice as well as things like taxes and business regulations and we can also organize meetings with service providers and different kind of um, groups in order to really you know alleviate some of the, the pressure you may have when you look to expand in a new place and launching an expansion we are also there through every single step as well um, next slide please so, you know, what is different about Hong Kong? Why is Hong Kong a good location for you to consider when you are looking to expand to Asia or another location in Asia? There's some fundamentals that we think make Hong Kong a pretty strong business location. And some of these, what we call the strategic um, fundamentals, um, are, are listed here. So in terms of fundraising, um, you know, we've always been a fundraising capital here, um, and that's why we are one of the world's financial centres. We've also been the number one in IPOs funds raised for, you know, we're always like the top one or two countries. And in fact, I think for the past um, 10 years, we've been the number one IPO location for the past seven years. Um, we've also changed the the regimes within the stock exchange to allow for weighted voting rights as well as for um, pre-revenue biotech listing as well. These are pretty fundamental changes if you're looking to raise money and um, it basically allows us, especially in the tech side, to potentially compete with other exchanges that allow for weighted, voted, weighted voting rights as well. We are a free and open market, so there's free movement of capital, talent, goods, information, and we also operate on a free trade regime and a free port kind of status. This means then that we have a very simple um, tax system. We have a, a you know a two-tier corporate tax system whereby for the first two million dollars worth of Hong Kong profit that you actually make. There's a charge of 8.25% tax on it, and anything above that $2 million in profit, it's actually capped at 16.5%. Now, if you do a comparison with other um, cities around the world, with the exception of, of obviously tax havens, this is one of the lowest kind of taxes. And that's one of the reasons why we do attract a lot of the, the larger corporates as well as regional headquarters to our city. There is no other like VAT, GST, capital gains tax. So it really is very simple to operate and, and actually simple to understand. Our infrastructure is very, very comprehensive and very advanced, actually. In fact, you, you know, the Hong Kong International Airport, it flies to about 220 locations pre-COVID, of course, and we're hoping post-COVID, um, you know, we will ramp back. But it does mean that, um, you know, we have a lot of um, really good infrastructure if you are on the e-commerce side of things. So if you really need to rely on a location, a single location whereby you can actually deliver your products to a number of different countries, Hong Kong is a very good strategic location for that. It's also to do with geographic as geographic location as well. So within you know three hours of Hong Kong you actually access most of Asia's cities and within five hours you're reaching half the world's population. So it's a great strategic location as well for that because as you know being within Asia you know, we're making do at the moment with Zoom kind of meetings, but people do like to have those face-to-face -face meetings, especially if you're on the startup side and you're hoping to meet with investors and other business partners. Oftentimes, the investors do prefer if you can actually fly to them and, and have these face-to-face -face meetings as well. So, you know, you don't disregard the fact that the geographic location is actually hugely important. We run a common law system, so the rule of law is incredibly important here. There's a, you know, we have an independent judiciary, and we are the only common law jurisdiction within China as well, and we're a leading centre for dispute resolution. And with all that protection of the rule of law, IP protection obviously is very, very high up on, um, you know, the the list of priorities as well. Next slide, please. So we've actually been tracking um, 
you know, our startup ecosystem for the past six years, actually, we've been organizing these um, startup ecosystem surveys to a, to try and get a gauge of what's actually happening um, in Hong Kong with regards to startups and correspondingly how we might potentially support them, whether that's reflecting um, information to our policy making departments or just basically connecting with different types of people in order to support these different types of industries better. So you'll see uh, on this list here, this is these results have literally been um, just released about, you know, two or three weeks ago when our chief executive had to release that in the, the last policy address. Um, you'll see that a number of startups we've, you can see on the, on this um, top, chart here, the right hand side, we've got just over 3,300 startups residing at the accelerators, the incubators and various co-work spaces. And even within the context of, you know, COVID the past year, as well as, you know, some of the, the national security law issues that came up in Hong Kong, the fact that we're seeing a growth in a number of startups actually bucks a really strong trend, actually, that we're seeing in other kind of ecosystems. So it actually shows how resilient Hong Kong is in terms of its startup um, kind of opportunities. Um, the kind of uh, come the, the countries of origin for a lot of these founders are, you know, very diverse. Actually, it's, it's something that we're very proud of here in Hong Kong. About a quarter of our founders um, are from outside of Hong Kong, and we really believe this international perspective, a different way of looking at resolving problems, and a different way of potentially, you know, addressing these kind of concerns. When we marry that with the local know-how and language capabilities, we actually think that makes for a much stronger startup. And you'll see the top countries of origins listed here, the, the top six there, but the top five here, the mainland China, UK, US, Australia, and France, actually these five countries um, for the past six years have always been in the top five, but this, uh, the positions um, move a little bit. So, for example, last year, um, the US founders, American founders were the top kind of country of origin within our international segment. But this year, it's mostly mainland Chinese and the UK, obviously, is, um, you know, historical ties. We, we do see a lot of um, British founders coming here and setting up their startups. Next slide, please. If you look at the kind of sectors that these startups are employed in, it's also very diverse, actually. It sort of reflects the, the economy of Hong Kong. You know, people know us potentially as a financial center or a place for, you know, properties, uh, development, or maybe just import and export kind of trading. All of these things are true. But in addition to that, if you actually look at our economy in a bit more detail, it's actually quite diverse and correspondingly, you also find that this, this is reflected in the startup ecosystem as well and the kind of industries that, um, you know, the startups are working in. So unsurprisingly, our top um, industry sector for startups yeah. is fintech. And I said, um, you know, this is to be expected just because we are one of the world's financial centers and there's a lot of people within Hong Kong employed in the financial services sector, which means that when they, you know, some of these staff leave, when they're looking to start up a new company, you know, they address problems within their own domain expertise, hence the fintech side of things. E-commerce supply chain management and logistics is, is also a very kind of top, hot industry sector for our startups. Unsurprisingly, again, because we are next door to the biggest e-commerce market in the world, which is, of course, mainland China. You know, the recent, um, you know, 11-11 kind of singles day shopping um, festival has been, again, breaking all records as well. You probably would have seen, uh, you know, Alibaba and, you know, JD and all these other kind of e-commerce companies make a surprising uh, amount of um revenue through those those singles days and actually we're seeing that reflected across the board and other kind of jurisdictions as well not just in mainland china so there's some um, you know a lot of e-commerce companies there's the supply chain kind of startups as well as logistics kind of technology companies helping to address and streamline some of these 
and processes for cross-border e-commerce. Um, business and professional services as well, whether we're talking legal tech, whether we're talking about SaaS platforms, those kind of um, industries are also um, very popular here in Hong Kong because we do have um, quite a lot of uh, corporates here as well as you know the SMEs this whole digitalization kind of trend that we're observing in other locations and which has been increased somewhat by the, the COVID kind of situation as well we're seeing a lot of developments in this kind of space and um, you know some of the other kind of sectors you can drill into a little bit more as well can we go to the next slide please so I mentioned the fact that, you know, we do have a high percentage of international founders and also working alongside, um, you know, the, the local founders and to, with these kind of international and, uh, perspective as well as this local expertise, we think make for strong companies. And this is actually reflected in the number of unicorns that, that's been created. And you'll see we've got eight unicorns in Hong Kong in 2020 at the moment. Now, bearing in mind that Hong Kong is a population of 7.4 million people and the fact that we are quite a nascent startup ecosystem and that you know we've been moving in this kind of direction for the past six or seven years the fact we've got eight um, unicorns is actually you know a, a very very fast and, and high percentage actually is one of the highest per capita unicorn creations and we think that it's it's you know the mix of these this diversity of founders plus you know the business opportunities of you know surrounding us from hong kong through to the greater bay area through to mainland china and also by extension to other places within asia as well we think that brings a lot of different opportunities to um, startups and hence we've been able to grow our um, unicorn pool. And you'll see the ones, you know, it's sort of like it's quite diverse as well, the kind of industries. So the top line here, these ones, we love Air Wallex, TNG and Bitmix. These are all fintechs and Gogo Van Lala Move, you may know of them because I know that they've expanded in some of the other Asian cities. These are logistics um, companies. And Kluk is, again, they've expanded to a lot of other countries overseas as well. So you may have heard of them. They basically work on selling different types of travel products. And Sense Time is an AI startup that was actually started at the Chinese university by one of the professors and some of the students together. And now I think it's, um, it's, it's valued as one of the, you know, the, the highest, um, valued AI startup globally um, with, a, a, I think, a valuation of, of 4.1 um, billion US dollars. So, you know, these are the kind of companies that have come through the, the startup ecosystem. Next, please. So the current administration has made innovation and technology a very big priority. And in addition to providing, you know, support across the policy side, it's also put a lot of different types of funding that can support a company from its very earliest ideation stage right through to the exit kind of stage. I'm not going to go into the details here because there's a lot of information. It is all available on our website or you can reach out to Andy here as well who can give you more information about the various schemes. But suffice to say that um, I, I just want to say that the, the funding that's available, you can see from company set up, the left hand column there, from company set up right through to R&D, if you're looking to hire people in terms of business development and also fundraising and expansion, there are different types of funding schemes available that you can apply for once you're actually established here in Hong Kong. And, you know, our team would be very happy to potentially look at your business and make different types of recommendations on the types of funding you can look into and actually later on science part will go into a little bit more details about the kind of support they can provide as well and as well as the advice they can give you with regards to this kind of funding next please So the, the funding um, slide I showed you before was more on the government kind of support. 
Um, in addition to obviously public funds, there is also uh, you know private funds that are available, and we do have um, a, a very vibrant kind of VC network here in Hong Kong that focus on you know basically pre A stage right through to A B kind of stage, and you'll see these kind of um, some of these companies listed here. Um, the really early stage, like the seed and pre seed, that is probably more um, catered for by the accelerators and incubators. So, for example, Science Park would have um, various kind of programs to actually support their really early kind of companies. <laughs> yes, that, that goes into there as well. Can I just go back to the previous slide, please? Okay. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I wanted to say that also we've got the VCs um, OK, I just wanted to jump to that. But basically, the government also has a, a matching um, investment, co-investment fund as well with some of the VCs listed in the page before. So if you were in Hong Kong and you approach those VCs and they decide to invest in you, then, you know, the, those VCs can actually apply to, um, to the government to actually co-invest with them as well. OK, next slide. Um, so on the funding side, it's quite comprehensive, but we know it's not just a case of funding um, that startups need in order to bring their companies to the next kind of stage. We've got different kind of public um, support networks as well for different areas of uh, a startup's life cycle. So, for example, on the research and development, we've got the science parks and Cyberport, which are the two main science parks here in Hong Kong. But in addition to them, there's also different kind of research institutions like Astri, like um, LSCM, and those are public entities that also can do deep R&D in partnership with a startup as well. And they can also help you apply for funding to actually um, enact some of these kind of projects. If you're looking to basically do proof of concept testing, there are again different kind of organizations that will support you. For example, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority will look at fintechs, the stock exchange also. EMSD is a government department that will look at more the IoT kind of products. And of course, you've got Science Park that will you know, look at a bunch of different kind of products as well. On the trade and development side, if you're looking to expand to other regions from Hong Kong, we've got HKTDC with their event side that can actually really help you to leverage other kind of markets within um, the, the greater Asia kind of side. And for manufacturing and prototyping, um, you know, you've got the Hong Kong um, Productivity Council, which has traditionally had a long history of helping the other kind of manufacturers within the Pearl River Delta, now called the GBA, um, to actually help realize some of the opportunities that you can get your products manufactured and prototyped very, very quickly. And of course, there's a bunch of other kind of like um, organizations to help you with, um, you know, guiding you in terms of funding and other kind of activities, including Invest Hong Kong, of course. Next slide. So I, I did mention the Greater Bay Area, and, and this is something that you probably would have heard of before, at least being mentioned. And what this is, is an area of southern China within the Guangdong province, consisting of nine different cities here, plus Hong Kong and Macau. And sorry, please. <coughs> Excuse me, it's got some dust here, I think. And um, what this is, is there's the nine cities plus Hong Kong, Macau. We collectively make up the, the Greater Bay Area. And it's a, a policy that was set on a national kind of level to try and integrate this area further to provide better living um, for some of the, the citizens within those nine plus two cities or 11 cities in total, as well as um, business and work opportunities as well. Some of the details of what this area comprises is listed here. So this whole area is, has a population of about 71 million people, which is very sizable um, within a, a very small area landmass of of, um, of China. It's um, it's also got an incredibly high GDP of 1.6 trillion US dollars. And what this means is that um, it gives you 
as a startup, um, you know, access to a very fast growing consumer kind of market. So if you were looking to potentially sell to China, for example, if you come through Hong Kong, you might have prototyped or, or developed your initial kind of product and tested it within a relatively small kind of test market of Hong Kong. And then from there, you basically go through to the other parts within southern China to these other kind of cities, which incidentally actually has a very sophisticated um, target audience as well. The consumers here are used to a lot of tech and actually the big tech giants, uh, you know, quite a few of them have actually got their headquarters in um in Shenzhen, for example, you've got Tencent, you've got Huawei, you've got TCL, all those kind of companies have got their headquarters based in Shenzhen. And the cluster event that that generates is actually a very big opportunity as well. Um, there's also three innovation zones, um, Tianhai, uh, uh, Guangzhou right, and, and Zhuhai and all these different kind of um, innovation zones will have affiliated kind of policies in order to, to support all of that. So it is a really good time to potentially get into this kind of market because frankly the opportunities that are upcoming in this are going to be immense. So finally, you know, I, I just wanted to give you some kind of information about, you know, the, the kind of startup ecosystem, the kind of business opportunities um, you can look to when you expand to Hong Kong. Um, I wanted to mention the fact that we also create the Start Me Up Hong Kong Festival on a yearly basis as well. And this is an event that we do, we have been doing for the past um, five years actually, um, to try and bring all these different kind of players from around the world to actually come to Hong Kong um, prior to the lockdown. And this year it was like a, a pure um, virtual event. And what it is, it's like a whole week of um, events focused on different industry sectors, as well as um, you know, kind of different kind of support functions and workshops and investor matching, business partner matching, all these different kind of activities to try and support um, you know, the ecosystem here, as well as to connect the overseas players to what's happening on the ground here as well. And we would love to welcome you to our event um, for next year, which are in the process of planning and which is going to be held in May again on a virtual kind of level to start. And I would just like to end this presentation by showing very quickly the, you know, the video of that, and then I'll hand it over to, to the next speaker. Thank you so much.
I, I think I think we're good to to stop this actually. Thank you so much. I just realized how long this video is. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, next, you would like to invite uh, Mr. Spencer Chan, Assistant Director of Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation. For over 10 years, Spencer has accumulated a wealth of experience in sponsorship, tech startups, trade promotions, conferences, organized events, and solid know-how on mainland China collaboration with local government bodies. Organized events and solid know-how on, sorry, uh, 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 trade unions and business communities. He joined Hong Kong Science and Technology Park in uh, 2018 as senior manager of business development to drive and manage business collaborations and support uh, services to assist tech startups, technology transfer from university, and to catalyze technology and business development of partner clients companies. Without further ado, Mr. Spencer, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy. And uh, certainly thanks, uh, Keen Wai and also uh, Jane, and then for sharing um, all the, the benefits and also the, uh, the competitiveness of uh, Hong Kong. So uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes, I just really quickly to walk through a couple of uh, things that we haven't covered uh, just now in Jane's uh, PowerPoint. So I think the first one, it's uh, the market, particularly for Malaysian's uh, startup. So, so definitely the global expansion, it's uh, one big part for your, for, for your expansion, and particularly when you talk to uh, investors. So where should we uh, focus on? So there are definitely, there are two answers from today's uh, seminar. The first is the One Belt, One Road. So this initiative uh, was proposed in the 2013, and surely uh, Malaysia also in the also in the ASEAN countries. So they are all uh, included in this One Belt One Road initiative. So altogether, 68 countries so far joined this uh, initiative, and it's covering 65% um, of the world population and generating 40% of the global GDP. So this is a very big market that uh, for sure that we cannot miss. But just just it's how do we position our global expansion strategy. So the next one, the market that we need to look at is the Greater Bay Area. It's uh, all, the, all the figures that uh, Jane has just mentioned in, this, uh, in her PowerPoint. I don't, I don't go through uh, in details, but just I want to bring six important categories which are enlisted on the Greater Bay Area um, um, uh, proposed uh, by the uh, central government in 2017. So the six uh, major areas including innovation technology, green business, finance, infrastructure logistics, tourism, and healthcare. So for Malaysian companies that uh, if you are in these areas, so don't miss this golden uh, opportunity and to invest and then to expand the business in the Great Bay Area. So of course, Hong Kong. So uh, Jane has mentioned um, the six uh, different uh, 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 advantage of Hong Kong. I just give you three numbers as a takeaway today. So Hong Kong is the world's number one global offshore renminbi clearing center, and it covers seventy-five percent of the world's renminbi payments. That was from the SWIFT uh, twenty nineteen. So that means when you're doing business in China, and uh, so Hong Kong is definitely your landing hub, your landing spot for your um, Chinese uh, business. That uh, you set up the uh, the hub in Hong Kong, and then you can start doing the business in China. Hong Kong is Asia's second largest foreign exchange market. So, uh, and it attains a huge growth since 2016 with a 44% growth. Hong Kong is also the world's number three largest foreign direct investment inflow. So that means um, the funds are always abundant sufficient in Hong Kong for you to make more investment and to seek more fundraising. So the next part, it's uh, talking more on the investment. So Malaysian companies coming to Hong Kong, I think the natural thing is to get where can I get the funding uh, in Hong Kong? So uh, we've done a, a recent um, study with Punchbase. So for the top 600 Hong Kong investors in the past five years, we have uh, accumulated a 2,600 investment made and uh, up to 4.7 billion US dollars raised in, um, from these 600 investors in the past five years. So let's look into more in uh, what sort of like the details of these investments are. So out of those 2,600 investments made, total of almost 4,000 portfolio companies were invested. 
So you can see it's from a wide range of um, different funding rounds, including early stage seed, later stage um, venture, M&A. And most importantly, as uh, Jane mentioned, Hong Kong has consecutively for more than five years on the world's number one IPOs uh, fundraised. So it's also one important aspect that um, um, is for you to plan ahead of your fundraising activities in Hong Kong. The next, it's out of those investment portfolios, the top 10 industries invested. So you can also see that uh, it matches with the pie chart that Jane has just uh, mentioned. So uh, from the investors uh, who are making those uh, top investments, you see the top 10 in um, industries, including the uh, tra more traditional software uh, businesses to some fast growing business like fintech, like uh, biotech, healthcare, uh, AI, etc. So today um, um, we are representing the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks. So uh, at the Science Park, we have both the buy side and the sell side um, of um, uh, investments to be made by our, uh, by our corporation. So for the buy side, uh, we have set up the Hong Kong STP Ventures, was founded in the year 2015, and we focus on a matching fund one to one, up to one million US dollars for C to Series A uh, investment. So currently, from the year 2015, we have already made um, we have already made um, 22 uh, co-investors, and with a leverage of 13 times. On the sell side, we founded the Hong Kong Business Angel Network, and um, uh, including most of the Hong Kong business angels and the venture capitalists. So we focus uh, very much on the early stage investment. And so far in the past two years, we have raised 21.89 billion Hong Kong dollars. So talking about the growth. So that's more about the Hong Kong Science Park projects and also the programs. So first of all, we need to understand that from the seed round to, of course, is to the later, later round uh, investment, the Hong Kong Science Park has offered a wide range of different programs from a pre-incubation program called STEP, which is a one-year program, and to a two-year InQ app program, which is focused on more on business applications from innovation. A three-year program in Q Tech is more on the deep tech R&D, InQ Bio, focusing on bio uh, companies and life science, and we have the different accelerator programs called LEAP, so, uh, which we also invested in the companies and taking up equities and helping the companies to exponentially grow within the Science Park. Also, we have the different programs like Global Acceleration Academy and uh, IDM Square, which helps companies, particularly in the hardware sector, and then to finish the prototyping. And of course, into the later stage, we have some programs very dedicated for elite companies, and the matching fund can up to 2.6 million US dollars, which worth uh, up to 50% of the R&D expenditure. And of course, like Malaysian companies, when the first the first thing that you know, it's, am I really like um, uh, suitable for this Hong Kong market? Uh, so I want to go to the Greater Bay Area, but what sort of like questions I need to ask and what sort of like uh, the, uh, the the necessary information that I need to acquire. So Hong Kong Science Park we run a new program called Inno Express. So this Express program is to help you to make quick and accurate lending decisions to come to Hong Kong. So in 180 days, you're going to make the decision and then how you're going to land in Hong Kong. So the program is separated into three phases with the first one prologue, just like today, is a webinar webinar style. we we'll give you more information about the ecosystem. And then we'll definitely, we'll work together. For example, like this time, uh, we'll follow, definitely follow up with MDEC and then we have more pitching and then one-on-one -on -one business matching activities that we can run online. And finally, after the uh, travel bubble open between uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong, definitely we'll we welcome those interested companies, startups, and then to join the on-the-scene program. And with the seeing is believing that uh, we, can, we can definitely show you around in the Greater Bay Area and then to find the right spot and the right landing um, strategy in, in this area. So finally, um, and also uh, one of the most important part is how do you manage your costing, and then uh, how do you how do you plan for your budget? So uh, I just made it a, a very indicative assumption here. So suppose you're setting up a subsidiary in Hong Kong, and while remaining the main team in your headquarter, so which is Malaysia. So saying, for example, you're sending the CTO and then to Hong Kong as the general manager of the subsidiary, and this guy. 
in this to find accommodation uh, for F and B, and then definitely for the office, you need to get an office for the Hong Kong Hong Kong unit, and then you'll need to hire locally for an engineering team, and then doing two year initially R and D work. So let's see what is the num the, the indicative numbers. So it's very rough estimation, but before we apply any subsidy, it's around 350,000 US dollars. So it's very um, similar to uh, the other um, um, uh, cities and countries or regions that you're going to expand. So it's a normal like business setup, visa, uh, and then uh, setting up the bank account and then for the, for the payroll. But after applying the Hong Kong subsidy, let's see what happens. So for, um, for hiring a maximum um, a team of uh, local engineers of four engineers in Hong Kong, you can get a full subsidy. Uh, so it's up to uh, that um, um, 110,000 um, um, US dollars. And for the R&D expenditure, um, so uh, Jane has mentioned a lot of the uh, Hong Kong government uh, R&D funding. So for that, for those funding, you will get a maximum 70% off the R&D expenditure that you can do spend in Hong Kong. But also on the other hand, is to claiming your IP of that invention. So prototyping, free of charge, it's uh, covered by the funding at the Hong Kong Science Park. Tax, we have a tax rebate scheme that um, um, that we can cover your R&D expenditure for a tax rebate up to 300% of your R&D expenditure to your revenue made. So that will that will account up to 94,000 US dollars only. That is a 73% uh, of your costing. So it's a uh, it's a good moment, and definitely with uh, Invest Hong Kong, with Andy in Jakarta, and uh, with Jane and I in Hong Kong, we are always happy to help with uh, Malaysian companies and then to expand the business in Hong Kong. So last but not least, because uh, um, we're still unable to bring you to the Science Park as of this moment, I just give you a, a ten second review of uh, the Hong Kong Science Park. So enjoy and thank you. So thank you very much. Andy, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Spencer. Um, next, we would like to invite uh, Ms. Agnes Wun, uh, CEO of NewFast. Before establishing NewFast in 2018, uh, Agnes Wun has 12 years of corporate experience in workforce planning software development and business transformation for Fortune 500, and listed companies including uh, CK Infrastructures, ABB, and Accenture. She was responsible for the budgeting for the multi-million IT and engineering transformation projects, uh, saving millions of dollars to achieve operational efficiency and KPI outperformance. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ms. Agnes. Please uh, unmute. Unmute fast and uh, myself uh, to the audience. Uh, thank you, Spencer, for inviting you fast to the uh, webinar today. Uh, my name is Anna Swan, co founder and CEO of New Fast. Today, I'm going to talk about um, some of the um, understanding of Malaysia uh, when Spencer invite uh, Newfast to talk about our ambition uh, to do an expansion in Malaysia, which is a very interesting country. In fact, one of our um, uh, close uh, partner, they are uh, in um, in, uh, Malay in uh, Bangkok, uh, and also uh, they also have offices uh, in uh, Malaysia. So I have a very quick check of the statistics uh, in, of Malaysia in a Malaysian government website. And I can see that the, the GDP per capita right now is uh, of US dollar 12,000 uh, by the end of this year. 
And in the third quarter, the GDP of Malaysia rebounds uh, performance from the manufacturing sector, primarily from the export. And because we are doing um, uh, a recruitment uh, solution using video technology, the next thing that I would like to understand is uh, the statistics of the labor force in Malaysia. Uh, according to the uh, Department of Statistics Malaysia, there are 15.96 million people currently employed in Malaysia. And out of which, 15 years old to 29 years old amount to 9.4 million. And for Gen Z, for 15 years old up to 24 years old, that's 6 million people. And for Malaysia budget 2021, there are three fundamental goals. First is the people's well-being. Second is business continuity. And third is economic religion. I also look into um, the recent uh, study by uh, Facebook Hello, for business. Yes. Can you share your PPT with us? Oh, sure. Is that now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, for post Southeast Asia emerging middle class, the way they define their own modern identity is through the power of digital connectivity. While they still maintain a strong ties to their traditional cultural background, and the digital economy in all five uh, biggest Southeast Asian countries embrace their modern perspectives and convenience that balance their traditional culture with the modern needs with digital economy. According to a, a recent survey done by Facebook for Business with Bing, there are 85% of digital consumers across the Southeast Asia who tried new digital apps in social media, in video and instant messaging and food delivery. The survey also concluded that at home and contactless innovation are here to stay after even post COVID-19. As when we look into uh, organization hiring, LinkedIn survey shows that 46% of the recruiters and hiring manager have identified that finding the right talent as the biggest hurdle in hiring today. So new fast provides a one-stop talent screening solution for recruiters. It's very easy to set up an uh, interview with the interview questions in our portal and invite all the candidates for video interview pre-recorded so that everybody will have a chance to shine even they cannot contact face-to-face. -face. When the candidate receives the email and the SMS from the recruiter, they will do the interview video online anywhere, anytime at their own convenience with a good Wi-Fi connection. This is around 20 to 30 minutes of interview according to the number of questions set by the HR. Once the candidate finish the interview, recruiters can receive the candidate assessment report automatically generated by new fast platform, which can automatically scores for the English, Mandarin, Cantonese and Thai speaking job applicants according to their personalities and competencies. We also have a new career portal, which actually help with the mock interview preparation for job seekers. One of our paying customer is the College of Professional and Continuing Education, the Hong Kong Community College, managed by the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. First of all, the job analyzer will analyze the job description to understand the requirement and the skills required for the role. 
After that, students can have a personalized interview experience with our interview bot, which automatically generate interview questions that potentially can be asked by potential employer, according to their CV and JD. Once the candidate finish the mock interview, they will receive an interview report, which tells them what are their strengths and weakness in their competencies and how they can improve their interview skills online using video technology. They can also share the video with the coaches and uh, other peers for 360 review and feedback. So just want to share a recent example of uh, our B2B solution uh, supporting procruity recruitment uh, program that is funded by the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust. We are actually screening um, a lot of candidates uh, starting from yesterday once the program uh, have kicked off. There are uh, 12 positions in IT, community healthcare, creative arts and corporate engagement. According to VASK, value, attitude, skills, and knowledge of these 12 roles, we mapped it into our uh, 12 uh, competencies. And in order to score on them automatically, we have our IO psychologist and our data annotator to annotate accordingly to the job requirement. So we wanted to have an estimated candidate 50% reduction in the first round screening time and up to 70% of video interview completion rate. And of course, we wanted to help the client to reduce half of their time to fill position and time cost. Another um, overseas uh, uh, base in um, Bangkok uh, is called LinkedIn, GetLinks. GetLinks is an uh, IT uh, recruitment solution provider based in Bangkok. And we have earlier partnered with them to help with the local recruitment in Thai language. As um, Thailand was in a country lockdown and impossible to do face-to-face -face interview, uh, all in all, they are using our solution to help a Thai commagorate to recruit for many entry-level roles with 100 to 300 job application monthly. So this will result in 50% of the reduction in talent first round screening with 100% reduction on time to place all those clients. Just want to share also that uh, New Fast was awarded the Star of Innovation Award by the German Industry and Commerce last year in October when we pitched against um, a BASF a Business Challenge uh, using our mass recruitment technology for the uh, mainland China uh, recruitment drive for the new chemical plant going into line in 2022. So uh, I would like to say that uh, New Fast won't be here uh, in this success today uh, without the help and support from the Hong Kong Science Park Incubation Program. Uh, currently, we have office in uh, Science Park, Hong Kong. We also have office in Shanghai and in Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agnes. Um, next, we would like to invite Mr. Hugh Wee Chong, uh, Vice President of Malaysia Digital Economic Corporation. Mr. Hugh joined uh, MDEC in October 2016 as the VP. He oversees the strategic digital services companies to, do, to go global. Additionally, he, Hugh looks uh, into matters relating to the industry critical enablers or eco ecosystems to ensure the continued development of the industry. He has more than 20 years working experience and having graduated from La Trobe University in Australia in 1992 with the Bachelor of Science, Computing and Economics and Graduate Diploma in Economics. Uh, Mr. Hugh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Very good afternoon. Um, pleasure to be here in this event between Malaysia and Hong Kong. 
uh, especially when we have three esteemed agencies from Hong Kong, uh, namely Hong Kong Science Park, uh, Science and Technology Park, Invest Hong Kong, and Hong Kong Economic Trade Office. And I think at the beginning of this session, Mr. Lau Kim Wai have actually shared the economic statistics uh, between Malaysia and Hong Kong, which is always encouraging and always very positive there. And we always look forward to be uh, to have more collaboration between uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong. And of course, Jane and uh, Spencer have shared all the interesting facts and uh, ecosystem regards to the startups in Hong Kong. And in Malaysia, of course, we have something similar as well, which we'd definitely like to share uh, between uh, me and my colleague, Serena, who is actually from the growth, Global Growth Acceleration Team within MDAC itself. And uh, thank you, Agnes, for being a good ambassador of uh, Malaysia. You saved my job in terms of presenting Malaysia much easier as well. So what I'd like to do is I will start off by uh, sharing a bit more on the global, uh, bigger, broader perspective regards to Malaysia digital economy landscape. And then, as I mentioned, my colleague Serena uh, will actually share with you on the startup itself, yeah? So let me start by sharing screen first. Okay, I trust you can see my slide. Uh, that is premised on introducing Malaysia digital economy landscape. I'll start off by making an aspirational statement, a statement that Malaysia wants to be the heart of digital ASEAN. And why is that so, right? And we all know, we are all in Asia. We all know that Asia is currently in what we call the Asia century, right? The economic hotspots are all over Asia, whether it's in North Asia, where Hong Kong is, or in Southeast Asia, where Malaysia is, right? So Southeast Asia is equally an economic hotspot even more so in the area of digital economy or internet economy, uh, which is on a slightly smaller scale, but is enough to make us really excited about the future growth in ASEAN itself. Right? Uh, a lot of you are very familiar with ASEAN, uh, particularly Malaysia. I will not share too much about that, uh, but other than from an economic standpoint, right? Uh, all of you, a lot of you have been to Malaysia or ASEAN for holiday and Hong Kong as well. Uh, in Hong Kong, is very well known as Sing Ma Thai in terms of uh, travel, travel destination, yeah. But from an economic standpoint, from a population standpoint, ASEAN has more than 700 million population, which is nearly half of China. So it's a huge market by itself. Uh, naturally, with that, you have the third world largest workforce. From a trade value perspective, we are ranked fourth. Even from a world economic standpoint, we are ranked fifth as a region, but it's fast growing as well. Yeah? And uh, of the population that we have, more than half of the population are already internet users. Agnes was talking about the uh, population in Malaysia itself, where a lot of them are very internet savvy. So from ASEAN perspective, more than 50% are already on internet, even more so because of the COVID-19 situation. And if you are looking at internet economy uh, by itself, as I mentioned, it's a smaller subset of digital economy. It's already expected to be worth 240 billion US dollars by 2025, uh, fueled predominantly by the e-commerce. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the slide on the right-hand side, there are some tables in terms of the information regards to e-commerce. Of course, online travel has come down quite a bit because of COVID-19, but the increase in commerce has more uh, I'm sure more than enough to actually cover for the reduction in online travel. Yeah. So ASEAN all in all is in a very good spot regards to using digital economy to grow their next uh, economic growth in the next uh, 10 to 15 years easily. So Malaysia within ASEAN itself, we are less than three hours flight to the rest of the ASEAN countries. So it's a very well positioned. In fact, even from a drive perspective, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Singapore, from KL, where our capital is, uh, three hours to four hours, we are already in Singapore. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of traffic going on between Malaysia and Singapore, whether it's from a road perspective, whether it's from a flight perspective. Right? So that's a little bit introduction into ASEAN. But so naturally, I mentioned about digital economy as one of the key drivers for the economic growth of ASEAN. Malaysia, being the center of ASEAN, has managed to attract a lot of investment, particularly in the area of digital investment. Uh, I won't go through the logos on the left-hand side. You would uh, be able to be, uh, know 
what are the companies that have invested in uh, Malaysia. But suffice to say that whether it's technology company, because we are talking about digital investment, there is also uh, the more conventional type of businesses, whether it's logistic company, whether you're talking about oil and gas company, or even financial services company, have invested uh, digital operation in Malaysia for the region itself. So MSC, which we are uh, known for, it stands for Multimedia Sub Corridor, started 20, uh, 26, uh, 24 years ago. I'll get, run through the data or the history after this. We have actually in, attracted uh, investment in excess of 80 billion US dollars today. In fact, uh, I would be quite confident to say that by now we would have uh, exceeded 90 billion US dollars for a small country like Malaysia. Uh, today we have around 3,000 active companies uh, that is operating in Malaysia for the region and creating in excess of 180,000 jobs in Malaysia. And these jobs are not only for Malaysian, we have actually attracted uh, around 10 to 15 percent foreign talent to be based in Malaysia. Uh, to actually take advantage of the economic growth in Asia itself. From a composition of uh, investment origin, uh, naturally Europe, US has been the key contributor to investment in Malaysia. Other than Malaysia being our home country, being our host country, we have more than 50% investment coming from domestic company. But Asia itself, although if you look at the figure, it's only 8.3% but it's growing really fast, for the, uh, at least for the last uh, five years or so. And we expect this trend to continue in the next uh, easily 10 years or so. So bringing you back in terms of history, as I mentioned, we are, or MDEC, the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, which is the government agency entrusted to lead Malaysia economy growth forward. We are the guardian of what we call as multimedia corridor that has been launched in 1996. And within the short span of a few years, as you can see in 1997, we have already attracted large tech companies to set up the operation here in Malaysia. And in 2004, when AT Kearney, or known as Kearney today, started uh, an index called Global Services Location Index, or GSLI, uh, Malaysia has been ranked third ever since then. And... Uh, China and India has been ranked first and second uh, also, I think, for the same period of time. And it's not surprising why uh, China, and uh, China and India have been ranked first and second by the sheer size of the economy. So for us, Malaysia, relatively smaller country, we're very proud to be ranked third consistently since then. And of course, since then, there have been more and more tech companies uh, investing in Malaysia, the more uh, recent ones, of course, the Googles of the world, Microsoft of the world, even Huawei, we all know Huawei for right reason or wrong reason, have actually set up the Asia Pacific head office in Malaysia uh, for a long time already. Uh, I think easily for the last uh, 20 years, they have grown by leaps and bounds in Malaysia. And of course, even a couple of years ago, Alibaba have started investing in Malaysia. Uh, with the launch of our digital free trade zone, where Alibaba has been the pilot partner. And now we are actually working with a lot of other companies uh, to be part of this program itself. And of course, when we grow a certain economy, we all know that local uh, champion needs to be nurtured as well for uh, that economy to be successful. So we do have a lot of initiative in focusing on developing Malaysia tech champion, uh, of course, hopefully for them to be uh, unicorns. And uh, in fact, as I mentioned, Serena, my colleague will definitely share a lot more information about that because that's one of the area of focus. Yeah? But going beyond 2020, looking, moving from ICT as a cluster by itself to digital economy that cuts across the entire economy, we realized that uh, with the mushrooming of all the different technologies, whether you call it, whether you call it IOTs, blockchain, uh, big data, um, and uh, quantum computing, edge computing, you name it, there are a lot of new technologies coming up. And all these are converging in terms of providing a solution to the uh, business community or to the society itself. We know that all this needs to be test beta while you have technology being created uh, in your home country, all this technology needs to be applied to, into the real-world environment so that it becomes a solution uh, 
as a value add to the community itself. And all this needs to be test baited. And Malaysia wants to offer itself as the test bait for Southeast Asia because of the multiracial uh, composition of us, the multilingual, uh, all the different uh, biological, I would say, inheritance of us, different races uh, living in Malaysia. Even the environment itself, a very, uh, we have a variety of environment. Give an example, drone tech. Right. When you have drone technology, where do you apply it? You can apply it in the cities uh, in terms of, of course, doing goods deliveries. Uh, even in city, they have all the different features, whether you're talking about high-rise building, where you're talking about neighborhood uh, style of houses, uh, whether you apply drone tech in the, uh, in the plantation. Even plantation, they have different crops, whether they're high, um, high tree crops or even uh, those that is actually sticking onto the ground. So Malaysia have all of these features that can help drone tech companies to actually test bait their solution. So this is just give you an example. There are a lot of other examples that we can go through depending on the technology that we are looking at here. Yeah? So um, from a digital economy perspective, uh, from MDAC perspective, for those of you who may not be that familiar with MDAC, as I mentioned, we are a government agency that has been entrusted Malaysia digital economy forward. That's, what does that mean? So it means that we are looking at a lot of different programs uh, which actually contributes to the part of the digital economy ecosystem. Be it talent, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our talent uh, ecosystem later. Digital entrepreneurship, which again, uh, Serena will talk a little bit more about that. There are various programs that we have to encourage, whether it's startups, uh, or tech startups, or even SMEs or micro SMEs to get onto the digital bandwagon. So whether you are selling technology as a solution or you're leveraging on technology to actually help to enhance your business itself, these are all the diff different things that we're looking at. Uh, digital adoption uh, in terms of getting manufacturing companies to digitalize before, um, before it's too late because everybody is digitalizing. Uh, in terms of gig economy, uh, we know that a lot of younger generation like to be able to work where they want to work, when they want to work, how they want to work, right? They want to be bounded by the office environment in that sense. So all this comes under the different programs that we have. Digital creative uh, content is an, uh, I would say, undershouted success of Malaysia. We do have a lot of talent that has helped uh, companies, whether it's in the Western world, to create animated movies, to create uh, all the different world uh, beating games, computer games that has been available out there. Malaysia do have the talent. And of course, in the area of digital or in the era of digital economy, we know that data is one of the key uh, fundamental uh, part of uh, digital economy infrastructure. So that's an area that we're focusing on as well. Right. Uh, I mentioned about uh, test baiting. So we do see Malaysia as a very important location for company to test bait their solution, right? I mentioned about drone earlier. And uh, of course, autonomous vehicle is something that's uh, top of everybody's mind. So we do have various initiatives uh, that allows company to test bait their um, uh, smart mobility uh, or autonomous vehicle in certain control environment. Um, we also have to look at the infrastructure itself. Everybody is talking about 5G. So Malaysia is also looking at 5G, when to roll out 5G. But of course, not to miss out in terms of the existing 4G that needs, uh, needs to be continually enhanced. But we are already looking at all the different trial or different use cases when we implement 5G. Right? Uh, fintech, uh, there was a mention about fintech earlier. And uh, fintech is also an area of focus for us uh, with the key focus on financial inclusivity. Right, uh, Malaysia is a country with uh, very different segments of uh, community or society. We have the what we call the top 20, the middle 40, or even the bottom 40 who are actually living on the excluded or secluded part of Malaysia who need to have access to financial products itself. So, our central bank is looking at ways to use uh, fintech to allow access to all these different products. Uh, mentioned about talent. So other than the encouraging foreign talent to come into Malaysia and uh, use Malaysia as a base for them to grow their career within the region, we also help to focus on talent development. Right? Talent development means looking at all the different programs at university's level, um, making sure the university is producing the right kind of talent. 
We are also looking at getting coding schools, the famous coding schools like the Light of 42, uh, Eco 42 in France, and in Malaysia is known as uh, 42 KL. They are world famous coding school have set up the operation in Malaysia. Uh, equally, we have uh, schools like General Assembly, Next, Ac uh, Next Academy, who are focusing on the same thing. That is to either produce new talent in the area of uh, digital economy or digital technology, or helping to re-upskill the existing uh, IT talent to leverage on the latest technology or to be skilled in the latest technology. Right. So all in all, uh, I'd like to summarize, although 10 minutes may not do uh, full justice to what Malaysia can offer, uh, we are very business friendly in the sense that there are various ranking that has put us in a very high note in terms of our uh, environment, encouraging business to set up here, in terms of protest, uh, protecting investors, uh, especially in, the, in terms of their rights in Malaysia. I mentioned about AT Kani ranking, which speaks for itself. Um, we do have a lot of different ecosystem that is supporting the investment in Malaysia, whether we are talking about chambers, uh, whether we are talking about the big four organization who have all their operation in Malaysia to welcome investors to set up the operation here. And of course, um, what I have not put up there in terms of slide is other, uh, I would say ecosystem, if I may, uh, for example, events. Uh, we just had our Malaysia Tech Month last month, which is a month long event showcasing Malaysia to the world regards to what we can offer in terms of digital economy. Uh, we were supposed to have World Congress for IT. It's always known as the Olympic of IT uh, up in the st uh, state of Penang sometime last month, but because of COVID, and now this will be done in 2022. And also probably you have heard that uh, Hong Kong have loaned us Rice Summit. Uh, Rice has been domiciled in Hong Kong for a long time, uh, but in 2022, it will actually make its presence felt in KL. But I think what, what is important is it showcase the strength of digital economy in the entire Asia, where Hong Kong and Malaysia is. So just to wrap it up, um, you were talking about, I think uh, quite a few were talking about Hong Kong being a gateway uh, to China, uh, to the Greater Bay Area, and we like to see Malaysia as the gateway to ASEAN. Yeah. So with that, I'll wrap up my presentation so that we can move on to Serena. But before that, let me pass you back to Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Um, next, we would like to invite Ms. Serena Chang. Serena Chang joined Malaysia Digital Economic Corporation in 2013. Uh, at MDEX, she is part of the Global Growth Acceleration Team that champions the growth of Malaysian tech companies globally. Her work focused on increasing access and engagement within the Malaysian and foreign tech ecosystem. Uh, without further ado, uh, Ms. Serena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hugh, for summarizing uh, most of what Malaysia is offering. So I'm Serena. I'm from the Global Growth Acceleration. So our team looks into the growth of the startup ecosystem. Um, we look into the end-to-end -end from, uh, from, from the start of the company and how we are able to get you funding, mentorship, market access, and then to grow you as well as the local um, local tech ecosystem in Malaysia. So um, I'll, I'll just go through this a little bit. So the overview of uh, Malaysia. So we have a population of 32 million uh, with um, internet user of over 80%. So our mobile penetration is and social media use is over 80% of our population. And out of this, um, we have over 3000 startups in Malaysia. I believe the number is growing. And this year, Startup Genome ranked um, Malaysia as the 11th um, emerging startup ecosystem in the world. Um, our startup ecosystem, uh, the digital economy contributes 18.5% 18 to our digital um, economy and GDP overall. And for our startups, our focus industry are at these six areas. Um, they are FinTech. Um, we have a division looking into FinTech um, and Islamic tech. Um, games, um, so we have um, games where um, they have a level up, which is our um, center that um, looks into development of games, um, big data and AI, um, e-commerce that's very big in Asia and Southeast Asia, I believe, uh, with all the 11-11, 12-12 sales coming up. And then we have agri-tech and as well as manufacturing. 
Um, I just want to go through quickly why Malaysia is uh, will be a good destination for startups. Um, we are stretch, strategically located, um, as shared by uh, Mr. Hugh earlier, um, three hours uh, flight to all um, Southeast Asia country, four hours to South Asia. And then um, we have ports, um, uh, major ports in um, the cities here that are able to get us connected to the world. Um, we are pro-business and cost competitive environment. So our um, generally our um, our real estate is um, much lower com compar comparative to our neighbors. And then um, it's easy to set up your business here um, to set up a private limited or to open a bank account um, once you're in Malaysia. And with strong government support with all the agencies such as uh, MDAC, we have Magic um, that is looking into um, helping startups to be based in Malaysia that uh, we are able to provide um, these supports um, to all the to all the startups that is looking into coming to Malaysia. Uh, so we have always promoted uh, Malaysia as a gateway to ASEAN. So these are some of our um, um, successful startups um, like Kasem, that is a car selling platform, um, recently um, raised US 50 million this year. And they have presence in um, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. Um, as with our um, Easy Puzzle, uh, which is a logistic company, um, they have also presence in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Indonesia. Um, and Jernexu is our fintech company. Um, we just want to showcase that um, as all our um, um, strong startups here, um, they are able to reach to other neighboring countries with, uh, with Malaysia as the gateway. So uh, if you start if you set up your business uh, set up in Malaysia, um, we, we have a multilingual um, um, community and then um, we are able to access this country like Malaysia can be a test bed for you uh, before you go into um, the bigger country like Indonesia and also Thailand. Uh, this is the Malaysia digital ecosystem. Uh, we want to show um, who are the startup ecosystem right now. So for funding, um, we have VCs for our funding and incentives. So recent, yesterday actually, um, the government in, um, announced uh, our, our program called Panjana Capital. And through that, uh, we are able to raise um, uh, a matching grant for all the VCs to pour their money into the startup community uh, for about um, 1.3 billion ringgit. So this um, is one of the government initiatives to be able to, um, to create a robust funding system for startup based in Malaysia. And we also have all the corporates, um, if you've noticed, uh, with um, all the major Malaysian corporates like Sunway, Maybank, um, Exata, Pexis. So we have programs with all these, um, all these corporates to get them to work with our Malaysia, um, startups. So they have, um, they have like, um, they have test beds, they have like pilots and also POCs for startups to come and work with the corporates. Okay, let me go through. So these are some of the initiatives that um, we are looking at uh, for um, Malaysia Digital Hub is our um, certified uh, co-working spaces. So um, these co-working spaces we will be able to connect um, you with all the local startups as well as have access to um, partners with um, technology partners like Amazon, Microsoft, as well as um, VCs that is based there. So with there, you are able to connect with all the local ecosystem um, and local startups that uh, you, uh, you're able to um, um, discuss and connect anything that you, you may want to have, that any questions that you may have. Um, other than that, we have also a Malaysia Tech Entrepreneur Program. That is our visa program for um, startups that want to be um, based in Malaysia. So this program is a visa program that we have for two year, two types, which is a one year pass or five year pass. So if you are established entrepreneur in your country and you want to look into Malaysia, you have five year residence pass. Um, with this, you will um, set up your business within one year. And this is a residence pass, which is on your passport. It can come in and out. So um, the application process is easy. So all you need to do is just go to www.mtep.my and you have, can apply online. And our lead time is about six to eight weeks to, for you to get um, the pass. Um, as shared earlier, um, we also have corporate partnerships. And these corporate partnerships are the ones that uh, we actively look for 
um, local corporates and conglomerates in Malaysia that um, would want to work with startups. So we um, so we, we discuss and we'll talk to them like some of the um, problem statement that they have. And once they come up with all the problem statement, we will reach out to all our startups to see that, you know, how they can plug into the um, system. So we want to encourage our conglomerates and corporates to work with startups and to lower down the barrier for startups to reach these companies, whether in terms of connections, in terms of um, um, process in our uh, process with um, um, procurement. So we would, we would like to do this so that the startups are able to uh, work with um, the corporate more easily and the corporate will be able to uh, understand the value of how much the value that the startup can bring into the ecosystem. Uh, next, other than that, um, standing for our um, market access. So uh, what we do is uh, we have our market access program for to stick to our um, gateway to ASEAN. So uh, we have programs with all the partner countries here. We have um, over 12 countries and we have this program that um, Malaysian based company can participate. So uh, we have actively bring companies over to Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and we have um, accelerator programs. We have um, partnership business matching program so that um, our companies can access um, our other partners in the other countries. So we have over um, 200 corporates that we are connected through our ecosystem. And for all this, um, we have over 200 uh, companies that participated and then have reported with over 300 million export opportunities. So this is where we handhold our companies, bring them out to see that, you know, what other opportunities that you have outside of Malaysia. Um, we have also um, tailored accelerator programs with Philippines, such as Launch Garage, where if you are um, in the um, in the program, they will have um, business matching for you, and there will be um, your business development team over there to help you look for business. So this will make it easier uh, for Malaysian companies, based companies, to access all the other countries. Um, we don't want it to be a barrier where you you want to um, expand your business to Indonesia, but you don't know who to look for, um, who to um, work with. So we will also even work with um, Invest Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong Science Park to see that um, for this um, for this side of Malaysia, how we can connect to China, Hong Kong, and the Greater Bay Area. Next, so we have to share about some of the lending support that we are able to provide. Um, we, um, if you have decided to come to Malaysia and you know, like contact us, so we can provide you with subsidized co-working space for six months at any Malaysia digital hub, subject to approval. Um, we have corporate business services support. Um, we have company secretaries um, to help you to set up your business. Um, um, list of bank, list of banks that is working our partners so that you are able to open your bank account, um, legal services, um, and also hiring. So to to be able to help you once you set up here, what you can do to accelerate your process. And then um, you, we have mentors and entrepreneurial advice in Malaysia and globally. So you have a, you can access our mentors, and then they will be able to help you in any issues that, that you may encounter. Um, access to our investors network, um, for all their VCs that is under that is working with us closely to help you raise funds, as well as um, access to regional network for market access um, from the previous slide. Uh, okay, so if you have any question, feel free to contact me. This is my email. Um, I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time. So. Over back to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Serena. Uh, I guess we don't have much time to have for the Q and A, so we'll just uh, take a few questions from the floor. Uh, I guess we have two questions now. Uh, any restrictions for Hong Kong companies to expand business in Malaysia in this digital economy industries? I guess this question will be uh, dedicated to Mr. Hugh. Um, generally, there's no restriction, uh, except that occasionally if you are bidding for, let's say, for example, a uh, project of national interest, which I think is very similar to any country for that matter, there may be certain uh, criteria or conditions set. But other than that, we are not aware of any uh, restriction per se. All right. All right. All right. 
uh, further questions uh, is start me up Hong Kong festival normally be held in July I guess Jane could answer this actually it's normally held in January or February of every year actually <laughs> year a special case because um we had uh, you know a virtual event and for next year it's actually going to be held in May we're all adapting with the the virtual aspect of it at the moment Right. Um, I guess uh, we have also several questions from the chat uh, that I could uh, answer. Uh, how is uh, HKSTP facilities, uh, uh, facilitates talent acquisition for Malaysian companies to move R&D to Hong Kong? Yeah, uh, sure. I think um, the, um, the companies uh, definitely we have... Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, certainly it's um, for the teams when they think about um, uh, landing the r d and then they can really consider local hiring the talents in hong kong and in particular uh, there's no p uh, particular restrictions because um, the the program itself uh in particular like uh, setting up the um, the company in hong kong we don't need any like uh, hong kong citizens as a as a uh, requirement for setting up in, uh, an office in hong kong so um application to the hong kong science park is easy uh, as uh, agnes also uh, experiencing all the applications so it's just online click and uh, particularly that's good for um, this pandemic um, season so uh, companies can uh, feel free and then share the r d roadmap to us and then we'll, we'll just follow up, up uh, from there Thanks, Andy. Uh, also, next question to Spencer still. Uh, how can HKSTP help offer company match the right investors? Okay, um, so definitely, definitely we need the um, the, the investor back and uh, from the companies. And uh, and certainly we have uh, the different, uh, as I mentioned, the buy side and the sell side. So for the sell side, we still have uh, a lot of the um, uh, pro um, professional venture capitalists and uh, private equities investors. So uh, we'll be able to help uh, after reviewing the uh, investor deck uh, um, uh, from the uh, from the companies. And also, um, some of the um, the participants just uh, texted me and then sent uh, asked me to send over the uh, the PowerPoint. So for sure, I'll, I'll I'll share that with Andy so that uh, you can com we can communicate with all the participants all the time. Thanks, Andy. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Spencer. Uh, next, we have a question. Uh, what can I do to get more connected to the startup ecosystem in Hong Kong? And uh, I guess we have two questions for you, Jane. Uh, which sectors do you offer the biggest opportunities for startups in Hong Kong? Okay, uh, for the first question, um, how do you get plugged into the ecosystem here? Um, please feel free to, to reach out to us um, directly to Andy if you're based in Malaysia. Um, and we've got other offices overseas as well. And they would be your first point of contact. They will, you can also connect uh, directly connect to our team. And what we do is... Normally, you know, we would actually have you come over and then we would introduce different kind of people to you and, you know, potentially um, connect you with people like Spencer and other people at other locations for you to actually directly visit and, and chat more with and find out what the situation is on the ground. Now, in light of the, the COVID and travel restrictions, we really suggest a good way to do it would be to... Um, you know, still reach out to us directly and we'll, we'll talk with you, but to also leverage um, platforms like the Stand Me Up Hong Kong Festival or like other kind of um, events that are going on in, the, in Hong Kong, because oftentimes there's lots of different people, um, you know, attending these events and it's a good way to really get a quick snappy summary of what's going on in, in the marketplace here and to try and connect to various kind of people. Now, the, the second question, what kind of sectors provide opportunities and, and do we prioritise certain sectors? Um, you know, the, the Hong Kong government, you know, definitely has seen, you know, the big opportunities that make sense for us here in Hong Kong. So in terms of the big picture, you know, there are several different types of industry sectors we're looking at, like fintech, for example, AI, smart city, um, smart manufacturing. Those are the, the the big bucket areas but in terms of invest hong kong and on the startup side we actually support across the board we do find though if you are in a stage of company where you've already got a level of traction and you're already you know generating a reasonable amount of revenue we find that typically those kind of companies are the ones that really can hit the ground running when they get to hong kong 
and also you know through our support through the GBA as well. So if you're really, really early stage, um, you know, it might take a little bit longer for you to actually get established and, and get onto the various kind of um, acceleration programs or incubation programs in order to, to do that soft landing properly. But, you know, we would be happy to, to provide you with, with advice on that. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Uh, next, uh, we have a question to Mr. Ken Wailo. Uh What will be the impact of the new security law to the business environment in Hong Kong? And what are the government initiatives to cope with the pandemic and how it could affect the international business environment? The floor is yours. Right. Um, yes. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I'll just try to give you. Um, um, I would say I try to give you a very uh, precise uh, response uh, to that. So the national security law, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, it, it was um, the objective of it is to um, to restore peace and order in Hong Kong. So if you have been following the development in Hong Kong over the past few months, so you could. Uh, I'm quite sure that you could see the effect. Uh, I mean, positive effect of that uh, law on the business and investment uh, environment. I, I, I would say, I mean, for, for, for businessmen or for investors, so what you are looking for in a city or in a location is um, the uh, predictability, certainty, and uh, clarity when it comes to the uh, business environment and also the, um, the laws and judicial systems uh, that uh, you are going to experience in the city. So on those regards, uh, with the security law, a uh, national security law in place. So um, Hong Kong is um, is the usual city that uh, you have been uh, you have known for many many years. So and uh, and and it also it also set the pace and uh, the pathway for us to um, to further engage with our ASEAN counterparts, with our Malaysian counterparts. And uh, so, so, um, so, so I guess uh, once again, as I said in my opening remarks, so there's no need to worry uh, about the uh, national security law uh, from the business and investment uh, perspectives. And um, so, about the pandemic, um, um, the, the the situation in Hong Kong, I would say, in comparative terms, uh, is uh, is okay. Of course, we are experiencing some ups and downs, just like. Uh, just like many other countries and uh, and, and cities and localities uh, have been, um, so the the the, um, the the strategy or or the the objective is to strike a balance between um, between um, protecting uh, people's lives and to and 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 also uh, sustaining or, or or letting the economy uh, uh, I would say thrive uh, run and thrive uh, uh, eventually. So uh, and and uh, it's basically brand new to uh, anybody, uh, everybody in the world. So uh, we uh, we pay very uh, we are paying very particular attention to the uh, to the to the development on the ground, and uh, we uh, we we always uh, base um, we always make our decision based on uh, scientific evidence, and uh, we also have to think about uh, the longer term uh, impact on the uh, on the society in Hong Kong as a whole. And 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 I, I would say um, um, there there has been um, if you look at the past few months, so there have been some very positive developments in Hong Kong in terms of uh, in terms of uh, new ways that we have come up with to uh, to tackle the challenges and also to look for new business opportunities. So some of the figures like the uh, like on the investment side, like the IPOs. And also uh, some other uh, companies. Uh, I mean, uh, in the startup scene in Hong Kong. So you can see some very positive developments even at the time of the pandemic. So uh, I mean, once again, uh, in these very difficult times, it's, it's about how resilient uh, the uh, society is and how flexible and how versatile the business sector uh, is. So on those two fronts, I think we uh, we are very fortunate to share with our Malaysian uh, friends that we are pretty much doing quite. Uh, okay, and uh, and and um, as um, as our speakers uh, from both sides have mentioned, so you could you could see it, you, you could see that uh, both the uh, Hong Kong government and the Malaysian government are paying very specific attention, and and uh, we're spending much efforts to make um, the, uh, the the environment as conducive and as business friendly as possible. 
and we uh, we do adopt uh, regional perspective when it comes to uh, when it comes to innovation and technology development both in Hong Kong and Malaysia as well. So uh, and and I, I, I guess uh, we also have dedicated agencies both in Malaysia and Hong Kong to uh, to assist and to provide assist, uh, to provide help to those who would like to explore the Malaysian markets and also the Hong Kong market uh, uh, at the same time. So. Uh, so in a nutshell, um, I, I think the, 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 the potential and the prospect and the environment in both Malaysia and Hong Kong, uh, I would say are, are very bright and uh, it all comes, it all boils down to uh, specific uh, business objectives and uh, business model of, uh, of businesses and companies from both Malaysia and Hong Kong, how they would like to explore the ASEAN market, they would like to explore the, the, uh, the, the, the bigger, Asian markets as well, and uh, the connection in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, I would say is quite comprehensive, and it's, it's another plus for companies here in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Uh, next, we have uh, two questions for uh, Mr. Hugh. Uh, why is Malaysia being considered the regional test bed for ASEAN, and what are the short-term and long support provided by the MDEC for Hong Kong based companies which plans to set up in Malaysia? Uh, thanks Andy, sorry I missed your second question, can you repeat the second question? Uh, what are the short term and long term support uh, mm -hmm. provided by the MDEC for Hong Kong based companies which plans to set up in Malaysia? Okay. Yeah, I think the first question is regards to uh, test baiting in Malaysia. As we know that uh, digital economy, uh, in regards to technology, the test baiting is very much premised on data, right? Uh, I mentioned about drone tech as an example, where you need to test uh, the drone tech application in different kind of environment. But going beyond uh, that, if you even if you talk about let's say health uh, tech itself, right? You need to try or test bait your solution on different type of, uh, uh, let's say, races, different type of genes, uh, different type of reaction by human being. And Malaysia is actually a melting pot of ASEAN. You have all the different races here. And uh, in fact, even in terms of um, society, what do you call it, uh, the level of society, we have the, uh, what I call the top 20 which are the, the, those who are of higher society, uh, echelon of society. More well off from a wealth perspective, their adoption of digital technology can be quite different compared to the medium 40 or even the bottom 40, right? So when you have a certain technology, you want to be tested over a different segment of both environment, a different segment in terms of society. And Malaysia actually offers that to uh, the technology companies per se, right? So that's to answer your first question. I think the second question in terms of short-term and long-term support for digital tech companies, whether it's startups or otherwise, um, uh, Serena was talking about some of the programs that we have, for example, the MTEP, Malaysia Technology Entrepreneur Program, where it allows uh, technopreneur uh, to actually not only set up operation, but to base themselves in Malaysia over a period of time because typically techno entrepreneurs are not uh, employee, professional employee per se, right? So the work permit that a lot of uh, countries provide are typically for professional employees. So for techno entrepreneurs, they require a different kind of work permit and that is addressed through MTAP. That's one. Second is uh, Serena also mentioned about the cost of doing business in Malaysia, right? If you look at the entire Southeast Asia, you have those a bit more uh, top end, or more expensive. There are those that uh, provides the lower end in terms of cost. Malaysia, we feel is right at the sweet spot. Uh, we brand ourselves as cost effective. Cost effective in the sense that you get the type of infrastructure that is needed for digital economy. Then you get the type of talent that's required, the kind of ecosystem that is required at a very affordable uh, cost in that sense. So that is to at least to land in Malaysia first. Once you're settled down, once you've built your business, and once you're ready to go into other parts of uh, ASEAN, uh, Serena was also sharing in terms of the program that we have uh, to bring companies, Malaysian-based companies, 
right, uh, to other countries, the 12 countries uh, across the entire region. So that is on the medium, on the longer term, when the rate company is ready to grow, there will be other programs that's uh, associated with that. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Mr. Hugh. Uh, next, we have uh, two questions for Ms. Serena. Uh, you position Malaysia as a launchpad for Southeast Asia. Are there any support for Hong Kong companies to access countries in the region? And the second question would be, uh, what are the processes of hiring uh, foreign talent in Malaysia? Okay, for, uh, for the first question, uh, for the companies that are looking into coming into Malaysia and what support that we are able to provide, uh, we are also looking into building um, programs, inbound programs, not just Hong Kong or any other countries who want to look into Malaysia. We are um, will be running an um, ecosystem tour where you can come here and then get to um, get to know the ecosystem, who and what here to be able to make your um, your final decision to be based here. And then we have also the long term, um, the, the longer engagement ones where you come here and we um, some sort of like crash course for accelerated crash, crash course to, for Malaysia. So you get to know who's who here, how, what is the culture, business culture here, how do you want to set up here, um, who, are, um, um, who, are, who are all our partners over here. So that way you'll be able to make an informed decision whether Malaysia is the right market for you. Um, as for the second question, um, other than MTAP, we also have the FKW, which is a foreign knowledge worker visa that uh, MDEC provides. So um, you, um, if you register your company um, as a technology company here and you can apply the visa through MDEC, you can hire your, say, your CTO back from your country. So that way you'll be able to um, shape your core team right here in Malaysia before hiring the locals here. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Uh, I guess there will be, uh, this will be the last two questions to uh, Ms. Agnes uh, from NewFast. Uh, what are the aspirations of NewFast in Malaysia and the ASEAN market? And the second question is, what, in what way can NewFast contribute to the digital uh, economy of Malaysia? Okay, thank you, Andy, for the questions. Um, NewFast uh, is really excited about the um, economy uh, prospect of Malaysia, uh, especially uh, the digital economy. And as a tech startup uh, located in Hong Kong, we are very fortunate to be at this uh, point where our products are ready for market. Uh, we have uh, tested our product uh, locally in Hong Kong with paying customers, as I shared earlier. And so with the product market fit uh, already uh, achieved, what I would say is that uh, we will further wanted to have uh, POC opportunities uh, in Malaysia, as uh, Mr. Hu already mentioned that Malaysia is the pot mel melting pot of uh, different cultures uh, for ASEAN countries. There are Malay, there are Chinese, there are Indians, uh, co co concurrently working and living um, in in such a big uh, country, and uh, in fact, I was uh, studying for my undergraduate degree uh, in electrical engineering from a National University of Singapore uh, under a, a, a government scholarship. So, uh, I my best friend is actually a Malaysian. Chinese. So this is a very uh, interesting um, timing for NewFast uh, to uh, explore our footprint in Malaysia. And yes, and of course, uh, for the second question, uh, for digital economy contribution by NewFast, what we can do is uh, a few fronts. First, of course, as uh, Mr. Hu also mentioned, uh, talent in this digital economy is paramount in terms of uh, pushing this forward uh, for Malaysia. So uh, our talent acquisition tool would be helpful for uh, uh, startups as well as uh, more uh, traditional industry companies to uh, use, utilize so that they can uh, fill up their positions for their talent in a more efficient way and with a lower cost. And of course, uh, for our tool for uh, 
job seekers. These new career tools basically can help job seekers to identify the roles and the positions, what they need in terms of skills and competencies, and they can map out their career path uh, when they are embarking on their first uh, job in, in the job market. So this is also helping um, the digital economy to grow into a more of a, a digital base where there are a lot more IT roles, and, uh, digital marketing, and also um, uh, consulting, and that kind of roles uh, appearing. Uh, so um, with, with the it, with the with the understanding of the changing job market and the requirement of the skill set, uh, the, the 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 the, pop, the population of uh, the ASEAN country can uh, uh, learn more about uh, the opportunities in the job market and equip themselves with the latest uh, skill set in order to achieve that that that, that uh, goal in in the career. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Uh, I guess this will be the end of the webinar uh, session today. Uh, thank you again for attending this webinar. Should you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email provided in our contact details. We hope to discover more synergies in of the tech eco uh, ecosystem between Hong Kong and Malaysia. See you again uh, in the next event. Thank you. Thank you so much.